Hi, all. Let's just give it a couple more minutes as people come in to the room. This is Robert Schwenker hosting. And again, we'll just wait a couple more minutes and bring on other speakers. And what we'd like to do is line up people to, to ask questions, give comments and so forth. We'll start at approximately one minute uh, in one minute. And we'll also ask that each person take approximately one minute to pose a question or provide a comment or response. Can you add the Discord invite link to the room so that anyone who comes in can see that and potentially join the conversation in text also? Yes, we'll do that. Thanks so much for the, the, the uh, idea. Okay, thank you all for joining. This is Robert Schwenker. I'm here as co-host with Golda Velas for the community after party. Thanks so much for all the, the speakers who've joined us who were on the previous panel, Brooklyn, Tim, Daniel, and others. I'd like to invite uh, Brooklyn, perhaps. Would you like to give some opening remarks? Uh I, I suppose I can, just in uh, reflection on the last hour, I suppose. Please. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, interesting panel, fun. Um, uh, uh, Tim was saying uh, uh, as well, you know, it's it's interesting that we're all agreeing so much, right? Um, so there's uh, a lot of, um, uh, you know, folks doing this work, these things that are talking obviously in, in other channels and, and coming to consensus. Um, uh, I was hoping that we'd be able to get into some of the topics on the call. Unfortunately, that uh, didn't happen, but, uh, you know, as a way of sending, uh, you know, information and knowledge so it's not just controlled by a small cabal are doing this work. Um, uh, you know, successful, fun, uh, and uh, yeah, always fun to get on a, a call with, um, you know, group of uh, uh, smart people that are passionate about the space. Much agreed, Brooklyn, indeed. So Mo, thank you very much for uh, requesting to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I, I wanted to, to chime in on the identity discussion. I um, thought it was very interesting. Um, I, I do think verifiable credentials uh, is a, a good effort towards the standardization um, of um, how we can handle identity in the future. I just wanted to add, um, and I may have missed it if this was mentioned, but um, you know, one one solution that I've considered for a while is giving everyone their own identity and access management system. Um, it seems like they're relatively low sort of resource uh, consuming services and everyone could essentially run them on their smartphones. 
Um, and as long as they, um, you know, have connectivity, they should be able to um, do anything they need to do. Uh, and, and I see that as the root of solving the identity problem. Um, and if you can't have your own system, then you should be using the system uh, of someone that you know and trust in real life. Uh, that's the only point Good. I wanted to make. Thanks, Mom. Very interesting. Kalia, Tim, Brooklyn, Evan, Daniel, Michael. Obviously, the user experience would be super important. I mean, people, people generally speaking, don't want to run software if they can possibly avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, you know, the idea that it's just because it's running on your own device doesn't mean that it has to feel like something you're managing or owning or hacking. Yeah, I think that yeah. this might, um, you know, Mo, this might get to one point of difference in architecture. Um, the architectures that you choose for like a DID method or the persistence of your data for applications, whether it's Blue Sky or others, um, kind of touches on this, right? Like if you choose a DID method to have an ID that you maintain, you, you control, uh, that requires your, you to have personal devices online constantly at all times to be able to make that ID resolvable. So like, hey, I want to get your tweets, but oh gosh, I can only do it like while you have connectivity in your phone. So if you take a flight like for 10 hours, no tweets for you, right? Like that might be like a tough, tough sledding problem, but some architectures honestly do that. There's like these gossipy sort of protocols and they, they'll fall over, you know, when, when they're uh, subject to these use cases. I think that actually alludes to the fact that you might want a DID method on the ID side that has the ability to sort of persist your stuff, you know, when you might happen to have your own personal device offline, still trustlessly and without the intermediary, but have that be available. And then on the data side, uh, similar um, to this, is the need to be able to go get your actual tweet data or whatever it is, you know, independent of whether you're connected. So I think that there's a, a fine line, but if we have personal data stores that store encrypted information or intentionally public information in a replicated fashion across your devices and potentially some, some outbound endpoints, that would solve your, your needs. Yeah, great points. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's not unreasonable to consider, uh, especially in, sort of more affluent nations, you know, someone being able to keep an online presence, especially if you amortize the cost of doing so across, say, like 10 or 20 uh, or 30 people. Um, so the costs are low there. And yeah, obviously, as far as like getting data or, um, you know, any content related to anything that you want to do online, that would that would be coming from a more persistent uh, location. But the idea being that anytime that you are online and need to authenticate yourself somewhere, you know, you might as well be actually authenticating yourself instead of delegating that responsibility to a third party. Like you are already online by sort of like by the nature of you wanting to authenticate against either one of your services or a third party service. So at that point, that authentication sort of origin or authority or root can be uh, on a single device, but ideally distributed across uh, a, a personal network uh, of devices um, that provide authors, you know, uh, assertions that you are, um, and, and provide transparency to the end user that their identity isn't being used or, um, you know, impersonated. Thanks, Mo. Any other responses to Mo? Well, I, I mean, one thing I'll add is just, you know, I hope we're creating systems where it's not about just transparency and saying, hey, I hope, I hope you do right. I, I hope we literally um, give people the power to, to sort of like not don't be evil, but can't be evil, right? Um, where it is exactly what you say, Mo. You're proving your identity. You wholly own it. And there's no buddy in the middle to, to hope, you know, does the right thing. Maybe you could argue the wallet software that you use to kind of do that authentication. There's always like some software you're using, but certainly not today's model of federated, you know, login where you are literally hoping that they just do the right thing. So I think we're aligned on your desires. Can't be evil is a pretty high bar. I tend to reach for more of a, the Nash equilibrium is don't be evil so that people are incentivized to not do the evil thing. Well, I mean, one of the things that we've seen with crypto is that 
essentially you make it expensive to be evil, right? You can spam the network, but it's going to cost you. So that's one solution that I think has been uh, pretty successful there. But I'm I'm very hesitant. In fact, I'm kind of uh, against the idea of needing to put social identity on a blockchain. I think it's it's probably uh, massively unnecessary overhead. Um, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to get some perspective on that. So I, I don't think no, no maybe I'll ask this question to the rest of the panelists too. I don't think any of the panelists are advocating for putting actual identity data on a blockchain. I certainly am not. Um, I think the only thing blockchains are really good for, uh, personally, and it's just a personal opinion uh, when, with regard to identity, is the anchoring of the identifiers and the public key material. Um, so not unlike something like Bitcoin does today with you know addresses anchored by keys, obviously in a more scalable fashion, but that's really the role blockchain plays because blockchains very elegantly solve the chronological oracle problem. Um, and that's really the root of all identity PKI. So if you want an ID that could be resolved, you have to have global awareness of the current state of keys. And there's no really great gossip protocol. Well, yeah. kind of. I mean, you need, you, need, um, you need a routing protocol, right? You need a, a way that uh, if, you, if, if you're connected to peers who don't know what you're looking for, they need at least a way to, to get closer to the, to the answer. Yeah, so... Of the identity. If you have a non deterministic gossip system, there's always. So when I say chronological um, oracle problem, it's principally, ID is principally similar in the sense of a double spend in, in a way, in that sequence over time is really the important thing, right? If you don't have a global chronological oracle, what people can do is they can take tip minus n of state, like let's say your current state after like 10, you know, PKI operations is like, you know, state 10. What someone can do is acquire the key material from a potentially a past state, you know, four years ago, they just get a hold of a key. And they can go to other people that aren't gossiping or haven't, you know, or, or segmented, and they can try to, you know, pretend that they're you because they can say, oh, I'm this ID and see, like here, I'm going to present you state one through four. And what a, glo- a global chronological oracle allows you to do is say with absolute, with near absolute probabilistic certainty, um, this is the current state. It's a path. It's a it's a path divergent problem. So that's why I would assert that blockchains are actually very very good uh, for DIDs. But I'm happy to hear you know feedback. Let's take a quick comment or question from Pirate, please. If you'd like to introduce yourself, also please go ahead, and we'll follow that by Ant A N T T I. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I am just. I I'm not invested heavily in. Um, tech spaces to any appreciable extent. I know a little bit of code. I don't use it as a profession. uh, And a lot of the technical jargon does go over my head, but I do have other interests and fields in which I am more heavily invested. uh, Those being among uh, media and psychology. Um, And one of the things that I noticed during the discussion was a lack of focus on something that is so fundamental to human socialization, I, I, I'm just shocked that they weren't so invested in it, is, is code switching. Um, if, if you've seen on the Discord, I made a comment about this already, but for those who aren't, or, or I can maybe expand upon it here, uh, there seemed to be a through-line assumption of a continuity of people's character. Uh, but that isn't how we work in a social situation. We will drastically change our behavior based on how we wish to be perceived in any given environment from individual people or groups. Uh, We're a gathering, uh, an aggregate of many different uh, personas, uh, and we compartmentalize. Pseudonyms and aliases have a long history, and online is no different. I speak and act differently on, say, Tumblr than I would on Discord or Twitter, in real life with my grandmother, in, at work in front of my boss, and at work behind my boss's back. But the code switching that we all engage in, conscious or not, is fundamental to our socialization and didn't seem to be considered with a lot of the talk of, um, of, of the way in which our identities would be uh, brought together. In fact, I think there was even a comment made um, of that most people or I assume most people have a linked social and work identity. We don't. We have a 
compartmentalization of our personalities in this way, and Thank people you, will uh, yep. do that online in a much more readable way as we do with different social media accounts. So can I, can I, Piper, we really appreciate your, we really appreciate the comments. Thanks also for your contributions to the Discord. Let's yeah, hear from I, Daniel. And then we'll I, take I just our wanted next to speaker. comment because that I think that was me uh, who made that assertion, but it, I don't think I said exactly what you said. What I said was it's common that many people, at least over social channels, like they might have the same. A lot of people, most people try to do this, right? Though, if they're on like Instagram and Twitter, they will try to get the same handle. They very much want to be the same person. In fact, it's frustrating, right? You go get one handle on one, and then you go to the next, and it's like, oh man, someone got that exact handle, so now I'm underscore myself. That sucks, right? Um, so a lot of people do that. Now, with crossing over to work boundaries, that's a different story. Some people do that. I'd say I, I would grant you that that's rarer um, than, than social. But the point is, I'm not saying that everything needs to be public. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I can make this more clear. My assertion is that most people probably have a public persona. In fact, guess what? Everyone on the speaking thing right now does have one. You're all using Twitter. So you have one. Um, and it's up to you whether you want to correlate stuff. And yes, you should have private IDs and IDs that are segmented by, you know, the interactions you're doing to, to, to what you choose. So I just want to make that real clear. It's not, it's not either or, it's, it's both, you know? So, so Pirate, I think we're on your side. I mean, it's clearly the case that, that everybody has multiple identities. And there are two relationships between multiple identities that are easy to understand. One is you want to tie them together. And people who kind of live on live public lives online want to tie all their identities together because you know that's how they live. But even those people probably have some private identities that they you know they use for places they go privately. Um, so so there are, are are two. So 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 the one that's easy to understand is I I want them to be linked, and the other that's easy to understand is I don't want them to even be perceptibly linked. You know I, I want them to be completely disjoint, and 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 that's often necessary, particularly for you know uh, oppressed groups. To, to, for their you know, safety of life and limb. When she, what's in between that, though? And that's an area that we haven't explored very well. You know, what kind of partial linkage or partial sharing can you imagine between, you know, the identity for the film you're working on right now and your personal longtime identity as a camera reviewer or something like that? Um, there's, there's a big space there to be explored. But, but anyhow, I don't, think, I don't think anybody in this conversation wants to force you to tie your identities together if you don't want to. That's all. And there is a scary asymmetry there. If I have two identities that are separate and I want to join them, we're pretty good at joining those two identities. If I have two identities that are joined and I want everyone to forget, there's no one who can go back and say, okay, world, forget that Samuel Clemens is Mark Twain. These are two independent identities now. Like, No, it's too late. Once you dox a pseudonym, it's linked and you can't unlink it. Go ahead, Tim. Is your hand up, Tim? I can't figure out how to take my hand down. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> as long as it doesn't get too tired. So let's move on to Auntie, please. Go right ahead. Take the floor. Up to about a minute if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, really fascinating to hear everybody talk. I, I actually stumbled upon here when my Twitter said that Kalia is here uh, speaking. So, yeah, I totally didn't know that this was happening, but now I'm here. Uh, so a little bit about my, about my background, I come from Finland, I am a consultant in identity space, been working for the past four or five years with decent trust identities, also one of the founders of FINDI, the, the national decentralized identity uh, organization in Finland. And so, so I have a background in working a lot with banks, uh, with, with governments, with uh, distributed identities. Uh, so you kind of get where I'm coming from. Also, uh, my thinking may yep. be a little bit naive for many, especially from U.S., because we have such a big difference in how we trust or, our governments and and maybe financial institutions, etc. So it's been really interesting to listen to the discussion that uh, solely sounds like it's very technical. And I have a technology background, so that's not a problem. It's more like, for me, identity is always rooting into something and something in, in Europe, in Nordics, it's ma many times, not always, but many times in national registry, uh, there is uh, e either a stronger linkage or a uh, much, much more softer one. But uh, my question actually to everybody is that when you think about identities, in this case, I think about them, how heavily or how strongly they're linked to 
a strong um, route of trust, let's say a national or government registry, um, or maybe something a little bit less. So when we think about this from the social platform context, like we are in this in, in Blue Sky, what do you see the killer use cases with or without that linkage? Because this is really interesting, I think, is that we perceive identity from different viewpoints. So I, I perceive Great. them. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for your question. And after the responses, we'll go to Michael. Well, okay. So the, the 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 use case that started this discussion was the possibility of extending conversations uh, from within the walled gardens of individual uh, social applications, so that they could spread across social applications. And and clearly, you need a slightly more ambitious version of identity to accomplish that. And that that's enough to motivate me. Uh, I'll, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Tim. Let's go to Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I, I want to open with saying that I'm not a computer scientist, but I wander into these conversations um, with work and life. Welcome. Happy to have if, you. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, fascinating conversation with this panel on the last. Um, one thing that I'm struck by, and again, this is really uninformed by any depth of knowledge about computer science, we seem to be anchoring on identity quite a bit and its portability and protection of identity um, and how that is managed across different social networks. And I'm wondering if the focus should be more on protocol. And what I'm, what I'm kind of picturing there is a competitive marketplace of platforms where protocols could be spun up and then those protocols could be assigned to identities. That's my question. Thanks, Michael. And we'll take Yaski next, but after the comments. Kalia, would you like to respond to that? Michael Fena, would you like to respond? Well, I'll, while people are thinking, I'll say one thing. So when you're designing a, a protocol um, you know, on the internet where messages go back and forth and, and say that certain things have happened and request things and announce things and so on, normally you think of identifiers that identify participants as part of the protocol. So you know, once you've got a good uh, uh you can't really define, for example, a blue sky protocol without having something to use for identifiers. So it's clearly the case that once you've got a good system of identifiers, you can use it in multiple different protocols. But but typical protocols you sort of exist at a higher level in the in the design of network systems than than do identifiers. That's all. So the yeah, example I, I like it's... to give for that is the two protocols that use URLs. We had HTML and we had HTTP. One of these protocols says documents should be able to talk about other documents. And we needed to have URLs to be able to do that. That's what gave us the links. That's why we don't just have an internet full of documents. We have a web is because we have links. But those links aren't very valuable if you can't find the document that's referred to. So we also have HTTP for the hypertext transfer protocol that uses the same links and says, OK, go find me the document that this document is referring to. Having the URL enabled us to bridge two protocols and say that the URL is the place where the hypertext transfer protocol and where the hypertext markup language can agree on the hyperlink and how to link two documents together. So the ID empowered potentially multiple protocols to be more effective because they can talk to each other because they share a namespace. Does that make sense? I mean, additionally, it's um, the ID protocol itself. Yeah, it's kind of the glue. It's the underpinning foundation. And it's not a typically is not a super lightweight protocol. It's not, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's hard to just say, well, plug in your own ID interface. That'd be kind of like saying like, hey, let me just, let me make it super easy just to tell everyone to plug in their own version of HTTP or even at a lower level, like, oh, just everyone just use t this other thing, not TCP, right? Like, it's just like, it's, it's sprawling. And a lot of times the, the, hard, the hardware software and mix of technologies that back it has to be very standardized and sort of super interoperable. 
Um, so I would say it, it'd be a challenge to kind of make it plug and play at that level. But like the other speakers were saying, right above that, you can, you can kind of get cute if you want. Great. Let's now go to Yasky. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the talk and letting me speak. I... Um, it's it's been a lot of great ideas here, and I, I got interested in Blue Sky um, back in the day when an, an event in my country banned Twitter, and I and I thought to myself, why not create something uh, that could allow people to talk socially over blockchain? Um, and then Twitter announced Blue Sky, and I was like, well, that's what I have to join. So that's how I got invested here. So uh, most of the talk has been around tech stuff but on on the identity bit i i go i got inspired with what um i think was a pirate friday or something like that when he spoke um there's a lot that psychology has to think has to teach us concerning identity and i'm just wondering i'm curious is there any research going into how that can inform any protocol or like system of systems that come out of this um this effort like are we are we banking everything concerning identity based on what the tech allows us to do, or is there any further research into like more um, human centric views of identity? Is my question. Thanks for the nice question, Yaski. After the answers, we'll go to Nacho. Thank you, Yaski. Kalia, you should take this one. Yeah, uh, I well, I think there is. You know, there's been a lot of work to sort of pull apart, pull apart I- aspects of how identity works in the digital world into its constituent parts, so that there's more sophistication available. If you think about where we started, which was in mainframes with usernames and passwords for one computer for a range of users, and we've kind of gotten to where we are now. We have a whole different set of social systems used to construct identity and documents that we get from governments and other institutions that we quote unquote trust that enable a lot of commerce to happen. Those two worlds are running into each other now in digital, um, which is why we have things like verifiable credentials coming about, which kind of bridges these two worlds potentially in a reasonable way. I do think what you're naming about these human aspects of identity and the sociological implications of how we express ourselves online are needed, but we need, we need people who are in the middle like I'm one of those in the middle people I don't code I don't write specifications although I chair working groups that do write specifications now but we need constructive engagement with folks who want to participate in the co-creation of identity systems in the future and not just naysayers screaming at us at the end that we got it wrong when there isn't active participation from a diversity of quarters. And it's it's a two-way street. We need to make our communities working on these technical things more open and inclusive. Um, but yeah, I, I think it will be great to have more research in that area. And hopefully, you know, the folks who have power to fund research will be inspired to do so. Thanks for the answer, Tanya. Let's move to Nacho, and then on deck we'll have Billy Lob. Nacho, go ahead. Oh, my mic was muted. Hello, guys. Thank you for giving me the time, and thank you for the this space. Uh, I will give a little bit of an introduction of what I'm uh, building, developing. I um, I recently, like five months ago, I entered to a, a project called Proof of Humanity. It's a civil resistance protocol that runs on the blockchain, Ethereum. So you can register there and you can prove that you are a human. So it leverages uh, also... Uh, 
from Kleros. I don't know if anyone knows what is Kleros. The, if someone isn't complying with the with the registry, uh, you can get challenged by another person, and uh, you have to put evidence that you are really a human and comply with the with the settings that the the rules of the registry. So when you start uh, uh, receiving, when you uh, Nacho, could you please go on to your question or comment? We we are familiar with some of the systems, and please feel free to go into the Discord if you're not there already to discuss Claros and proof of amendment. Oh, sorry, so, sorry, yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, for the time time remaining. Yeah, yeah. Thank it's, you. I I wanted to make it faster, but okay. And I am building a marketplace, uh, leveraging this register. And how you guys uh, uh, think this? Um, Identity protocol can be leveraged to the blue sky. You think it's doable? Uh, it's a good idea, or you are analyzing also bright ID IDENA. Thanks for your question, Nacho. Daniel, Tim. Maybe that's a topic, Nacho, we could pick up in the Discord. I'm not sure there's any direct responses about the viability of doing so. So let's now move on to Billy. Uh, Hi. Any comments and questions? How uh, about one minute? Yes, Thank you. I don't I kind of have a question. So somebody was um, talking about HTML and files and that stuff before and links. And I think in addition to links, QR codes are very clutch. Um, and uh, you know, I would love to know more about blue sky and what exactly it's trying to do, like transmit text some way or something. Um, uh, but like the previous speaker just now, I have a product called card and I found that it's very good for giving my contact out and, you know, it's me giving it, you know, there's no search for other people um you know i'm going to eventually build out some connecting mechanism to like save i have group chats and chats um okay thank yeah. you thank you for the question we'll see if there's anybody ready to take that i'll say uh, my question would be is... who the person was that was talking about those the html and five to Aaron, to Aaron, perhaps, I'll and say also Kalia. Innovation Kalia. is great, yeah. and like join, like you are not the first person, and I imagine there's several other people here who have like done their own experimentation and innovation. Like, please, like join up with other people who've been working on these problems for a long time and participate with us. It's, it's very clear after I've worked on this for so long that none of us has quote unquote all the answers. All of us who are thinking about this have pieces of the puzzle that we need to figure out how they fit together to solve a whole. So join and participate in like the decentralized identity foundation is one place, the credentials community group, the blue sky discord. There's lots of places, but participate with others to co-create solutions. Don't just try and solve this all by yourself. And can I underscore that the Decentralized Identity Foundation and W3CCCG, as well as obviously Blue Sky, are all free to join. And you should be totally encouraged, everyone on the call, if you, if you want to contribute, even if you're not a coder and you're just going to contribute, you know, like, let's say it's use cases or help with guides or whatever, right? Um, just, just get involved in those organizations because we need, a, we need a nexus where we're all working towards this, row in the same direction, uh, my personal feeling. I just wanted to leap in and for a second and say, since that person raised, you know, the whole QR code issue, uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, we got vaccine passports as of a couple of weeks ago here where I live. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta show it to go into a, a restaurant and it's a little app on your phone that pops up a QR code and then they have an app. Uh, both come from our local Ministry of Health that, you know, reads it and says, yeah, yeah, this person, you know, was vaccinated and here's their name. And so, you know, that strikes me as a perfect sort of mini identity solution. I don't really care who you are. All I care is that this is your name and I can use modern identity technologies to establish that yes, you were vaccinated. 
Um, so except the um, problem with that, Tim, is those are static QR codes that rather than actual verifiable presentations that are more sophisticated and have more privacy preserving qualities. So I think they're a great starter, but if the whole world just becomes static QR codes for people, I think it's terrifying. I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is, a, this is establishing an attribute that it links a name and an attribute which is, has been vaccinated. And let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This works great. It is super reliable. And, and uh, I will be sharing in the Discord a link to a paper about why it's, it's dangerous and shouldn't be a precedent for more systems like it. Fair enough. And Aaron, do you want to weigh in on that? That question was partly directed to you. Mostly that I think QR codes are very valuable, but a lot of their value becomes with what they actually hold. So at base, a QR code is just a string of bytes. Hey, I pulled some data into my application. But the format lets me say, well, what of these existing identifiers that exist in the world is it? Is this just a string of text? Is this a URL? Is it an email address? Is it a V card so that it's compatible with like Palm Pilots? It was a very well-designed protocol and can interoperate with a lot of things because when you scan a QR code, it says, hey, I'm a this kind of identifier and then gives you the identifier, which makes it really great to combine with something like URLs or a credit card number format or a phone number format. I think that people underestimate the degree to which QR codes are effective because they're built on a lot of pre-existing protocols and interoperate really nicely with the existing world. Thanks, Aaron. Let's go to Somia. Somia, please introduce yourself if you like and pose your question to the panelists. Hello, thank you. My name is um, Somia. Um, I'm also like very interested in um, thinking about the potential of social media being decentralized, but also um, I, I'm, 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 I wonder if there's a way to think about this where it's not either or, it's, it's not either it's centralized or decentralized, but somehow somewhere in the middle, because it in the in the space um, earlier, um, it, it, it seemed like there was some sort of tension between two values um, that are that are important to this goal. The first one um, being agency, the agency of the user to decide whether or not, for instance, they want to link their accounts, and then. Um, the other issue is openness and transparency and what information is going to be um, available to the public. And I have in mind like what Kalia said about uh, potentially um, the, the, the dangers that are sometimes associated with linking accounts together. And so um, is, is there sort of a way to incentivize perhaps users to link their identities, but also kind of maintain their agency by choosing whether or not to allow this information to be public. Thank you, Somia. Well, I could say there's some natural incentives in certain cases. Um, you know, you, whether you have to link your identity, I guess, is the biggest question. Um, I, I'm not a proponent of having identities being linked all over the place. Like, if you can get away with just divulging, like, some information that helps you get whatever you're after as a user, that's probably the best thing, right? It's only if you really want persistent connection to others that you'd want to, like, add an ID to it. So an example that we've, you know, been going through at Microsoft, um, we have a hotel and ho uh, hospitality and, and um, travel arm of Microsoft. And they look at DIDs and personal data stores and say, hey, man, you know, it would be so great if uh, there's like your preferences data and certain stuff about how you travel and what you like. And, you know, all those receipts and reservations you get could be located in a data store that was like encrypted, but you could give it out in a more cohesive way. Uh, so you don't have 50 apps, you know, doing all this stuff themselves and replicating all this stuff. Now, I, th I see a lot of that data, that type of data as stuff you could just give out right? Like you don't even need an identifier to, if someone asks you for, you know, Hey, like, tell me, like, do you want, you know, what, what kind of hotel room do you want? Like that can just be a, a piece of data you send them that the protocol facilitates, but doesn't necessarily need to divulge some trackable identity. Um, so may, does that help? I don't know. Um, can I actually ask a follow-up to that? I, maybe, maybe it might help for me to be a little bit more specific, but let's say for instance, there was a possibility to, let's say, do some sort of voting um, or, or there's some sort of like a, a way to connect it to maybe like citizenship or even I think earlier someone was talking about um, like 
you, you don't want identity to be associated with just being human, but what if there was the potential to also have an, an identity that may not be consistent, but is perhaps a non-human identity, but that if you do show some sort of proof that you are human, um, that would, for instance, allow you to access certain things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access if you didn't verify your identity. Say, for instance, um, accessing certain healthcare services. Thank you, Sumia. And after the responses, we'll go to Lali. So, so you know, you, you've raised something that's come up a couple times in this conversation, uh, which is that uh, um, clearly, in some cases, you know, you want to link your identities together publicly. In some cases, you really don't want to do that. You want to keep them carefully, carefully insulated from each other. But as, as you started out by saying, you know, even if they're publicly insulated from each other, you know, you want a way to to sort of link them privately, so uh, so that you can you know, manage the traffic on all of them and things like that. And and as far as I know, that has not been well addressed at all in the whole identity conversation. Um, so 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 what's what's in between public and 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 private? So so and you know, several people raised that in the last couple of hours. So clearly, I think it's something we need to be thinking about. Well, the the what maybe an intersection you can draw is with certain, you know, better types of technology. And I'll address your use case, right? So you said there's this healthcare use case and you need to prove that you're probably not even just a human. You might have to prove you're, I don't know, maybe you're uh, a resident of a country or you're, you know, got a certain health plan. So maybe there's, maybe there's more to it than that. I think all those things really boil down to verifiable credentials. So you don't, it doesn't have to be a question of identity. It has to be a question of, do you have the requisite proof or, or data that you're holding that you can, you know, prove signatory control over um, to be able to meet the bar of whatever that business case is. And in the cases you mentioned, you might not even have to give a DID or an identifier out because you may not want to, you may not want to connect with those people ever again, right? You just want to prove something. In that case, you might have like a zero, uh, a zero knowledge proof credential that you can vend and prove that you are the sole holder, you know, you're the intentional holder of this credential and it's you, but you don't have to give them an ID to link it to. I, I see DIDs personally in a lot of these cases as you might give a very public ID or a segmented ID to someone as an added thing if you want a persistent connection beyond an exchange, right? Like if you want them to be able to message you back at your data store to send you a DM, like you need to give them like some way to do that, right? And so it, it's a total, it's a leveling. You got to pick what your use case is and then you level up the things you want to disclose. Thanks again for your question, Samia, and look forward to meeting you on the Discord. Wolven, would you like to take the mic? Wolven's been instrumental in helping us organize this event. So thank you, Wolven. Please go ahead. You're muted, Wolven. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Wolven. Um, <laughs> that's basically all the data I'll give out on myself. But other than that, I work with Blue Sky to help organize different uh, events and coordinate between working groups and other such on the community side. I don't work for Twitter. Um, but I, I actually have a prompt for the rest of the speakers here. Um, and I've noticed this is a bit of a pattern in a lot of the conversations that we've been having um, and initial confusion about. But um, I think it's, it's important to recognize people, like people want multiple identities. Um, people want different amounts of privacy depending on who they're talking to. Um, as Pan Fried Egg was talking about earlier, uh, this idea of um, having different code switched um, presentations of yourself. Um, but I also want to be important. It's important to recognize that it, I think identity should be platform independent. That it doesn't matter if you're using Twitter or YouTube or Facebook or anything else. Um, you should have an identity that works everywhere, but that you can have multiple identities that have nothing to do with each other, or you may be able to present a link to a specific person, but maybe not everyone. Um, 
This idea of self-sovereign identities is also really important. This idea that you control your own data, you control who has access to it, who uh, zero knowledge proofs have been mentioned, which allow you to prove something without having to reveal information about yourself. These are really important primitives, I think. And it's really important that we construct them in a flexible and universal way. Um, and that includes being able to have multiple identities, having a, a single identity reformed to a group of people or a specific entity of some kind, maybe a bot. And to have at least some of that be transparent, maybe not the exact members of the group, but that it is a group of some kind. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm very curious what the speakers have to say about this. Well, I think it could be, well, helpful, it could be helpful to look at this, look at this a slightly way. different mm -hmm. way. Um, I just, um, I just a lot of feedback, but yeah. I, don't know if it's, I don't know if it's... There's just, like, there's just like a... Wolven, could you mute? mute? Yes. Yeah, I think one helpful way to look at this and how I kind of see it is, and this is just, just my own perception. I'm not saying this is like the way you have to think, but uh, I see you as having one identity. You as a person only have one identity, like, you know, in the, in the esoteric sense, right? Like you're a single human being, like you leave data footprints everywhere. Like that's your identity. Everything you do, say, write, think, feel, that's your identity. You might have many, many, many personas, right? Like like shards of your identity that you want to present in certain contexts where you might not want to have a very public uh, persona. So you create all these personas, maybe you have thousands of them, right? And a couple of them are maybe DIDs that stand for personas that are very public. You know, like you, you want to go tweet, you want to do some stuff in the public. And then you have all these other personas that are strewn across that you manage that you only present in certain contexts that don't divulge very much at all about you or, or divulge like a completely different side of you that may be very different from others. So I kind of like to think about it like that. And that's how I see DIDs is like all DIDs are created equal at birth. They're just keys linked to identifiers, you know, and routing endpoints. Um, it's about what context you use them in, how you separate them and what you do with them that gives them the, the persona. It, does that make sense? I don't know. Aaron, do you have any feedback on that? Yeah, uh, my main feedback is identities are essentially always relevant to some particular use case. I have a, well, I shouldn't say identities. Identifiers are for a very specific use case. So for example, I could argue that if I am opening an HTTPS connection and I want perfect forward secrecy, the first thing I do is I make up a random number and I use that random number to do the handshake and say, hey, I am one half of this ongoing HTTP2 conversation. And when I'm done with the conversation, I delete the key. And now I get this forward secrecy that, hey, I cannot leak that key anymore because I deleted the key at the end of the conversation and I threw away the ID at the end of the conversation. I may have a separate identity where I make a key and I put a lot of trust in it. And I'm like signing my commits that I pushed to GitHub and I want other people on GitHub to know that I committed that code because it's got this very long-term ID. And then I've got things like my Twitter handle where it's very public and tied to my reputation. So each of these identifiers is going to have different scopes and different lifetimes for whatever the use case dictates. You know, there's a lot of systems where I might want to create a pseudonym, have one conversation, and then throw that pseudonym away. And it would be nice if our tools understood something of the difference between an identity that's meant to last for the entire rest of my life and be very deeply tied to the way I live my life versus something super ephemeral that I just need because like I'm opening a TCP connection right now. And at the end of the connection, I don't care about that ID anymore. Very eloquent. Unfortunately, I have to go folks. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks very much, Tim, for your participation. We really appreciate it. And thank you also, Aaron, you've been instrumental in helping us set up this event as well, including yourself and Wolven. Let's move on to um, Mike Staub. Please, please go ahead. And, uh... While we're waiting for him to come up, I want to give a shout out to Kevin Marks, who's in the room, the Indie Web Working Group and Microformats, really. 
has been an inspiration for, oh yeah, protocols don't have to be giant heavyweight things. Sometimes you can just add rel equals me to a link and have that hold a lot of meaning. Yes, I, I noticed Kevin as well and invited him to speak. Please, please uh, take the mic uh, after Mike Staub. Please come off mute, Mike. And then if Kevin, you'd like to add some remarks, we'd love to hear from you. He was one of the original participants in the Twitter meetup many years back, 2011, 2012. Hey, so uh, I just want to say what Aaron said is uh, spot on. The IDs, identifiers are always contextual. Like I, I need to create an account when I want to sign up for a web service. And it seems like the public IDs are kind of an easy problem, to be honest. So we should be focusing on private IDs because really it's all about the graph of relationships. Like if I create a handle, I should be able to specify in the protocol that this is only for you or this is only for this group. I don't want this to be shareable. And if it is shareable, I can find out who shared it and they can be accountable because you can't stop data from spreading on the internet, but you can at least know who shared it. And that's very important, I think. And I, I don't hear anyone talking about this in the Discord or in the community about how at the protocol level can we enable these It's breaking up a bit, Mike. Pseudonyms that are enforced. Mike, I'm not hearing you. Let's let's move on to IO IOH. IOH, would you like to make some final remarks? Time constraint here. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've been working on this problem, this specific problem, for the last four years. I've written <laughs> almost three iterations now of a, of a piece of software that basically solves all these problems. I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I keep hearing all of these ideas and concepts um, being discussed, but the, from what I can tell so far is that most of these things that people are bringing up and talking about are, are essentially user interface problems, right? Like we have, for instance, my, my software is built on top of IPFS. IPFS gives you, um, you know, sort of gossip channels. It gives you ways to store files. It gives you ways to link things, right? So um, in, in terms of um, um, separate identities and how, these, how you keep track of identities and um, we're talking, we're essentially talking about how do you help the user uh, keep track and s segregate, segment these identities in an easy way, right? Because unless we're all fancying ourselves social engineers and, you know, forcing people to have, you know, uh, publicly known identities, there's no way to really stop people from having an arbitrary number of identities and segmenting them however they choose. Um, and there shouldn't, there shouldn't be any sort of coercion in that domain. Um, but it, all the, um, the tools we need are already here, right? Um, we have cryptographic identity. It's, there's a lot of cool things that you can build on top of it. There needs to be um, interoperability. There's all these, all these sort of core tenants that we sort of all agree on. But I don't think there's really a lot in the way, like technologically speaking. There's a million tools out there. It's just about kind of putting them together. And I believe that's what I have done. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, IOH. Let's take from Joshua. You have the floor, Joshua. Might have to come um, up. I need to go. pass right now. Oh, sorry. Thank you, everyone. Quite all right. Okay, thank you all very much for joining. I'm Robert Schwenker, and I have some final remarks from the co-organizer, Golda Velez. She's had the head out now, but 
she's wanting to recognize that the many folks here have been working on their own solutions and Blue Sky is a community is an umbrella that brings together these folks to provide a working space where the goal is useful to others in the space. So it may be rather than a decision coming top down from a working group or from Twitter or from an org, um, the direction is gonna be based on organic growth, organic growth of these projects. In this case, a minimal protocol, the minimum possible way we can agree to cooperate might be what we're seeking. So Golda encourages everyone to bring their projects to the Blue Sky community and offer a way for others to interact with them through an API, through a data structure. How can we interact with your project without necessarily adopting it? And in the minimum intersection there, you may find some interesting answers. So that's from Golda Velez. Thank you very much to all. I would like to also thank Jay Graber and the Blue Sky organization. Please look forward to another one of these types of events next month. We'll be announcing it soon. And we'll see you on the Discord or the Matrix or in any of the other formats, including the GitHub, in which we interact. And thanks very much. And thank you for moderating and so that right we don't just keep talking for the entire hour. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Wolven. Thank you all.